Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode of Q&A, Kansas City-based Susan Vollenweider and Beckett Graham, co-hosts of the History Chicks podcast, talk about the origins of the now 10-year-old podcast, its growing popularity over the years, and some of the women they've covered on their fortnightly look into U.S. history, including Queen Lily O'u Kalani of Hawaii and inventor Lydia Pinkham. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Welcome to the History Tricks, where any resemblance to a boring old history lesson is purely coincidental. And here's your 30-second summary. Fannie Lou Hamer began life as a small child whose hard labor was key to her family's survival. She grew up to become a fiery civil rights activist who would not be silenced by intimidation, violence, or the personal wishes of the President of the United States himself. Let's talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. And that is the opening to one of the episodes of The History Chicks, a 10-year-old podcast. And on your screen right now are the two History Chicks joining us from their homes near Kansas City, Beckett Graham and Susan Vollenweider. Let's start, Beckett, with the story of how The History Chicks first began. How did the two of you launch this podcast? So long, long ago, I read a book called To Marry an English Lord, about all the American women who went to marry titled aristocracy in England and across Europe. Incidentally, the same book that inspired the creator of Downton Abbey. So we are cousins of Downton Abbey. (laughs) And um, I read that book and was so inspired. And I um, went to listen to some more information. I just wanted to know more. And I got on my iTunes as it was at the time, and um, could find really, really nothing that I um, could listen to. And I thought, I felt this kind of, admittedly, this cold wash of dread and (laughs) thought, oh, no, I've got to make it myself. And then I reached out to a person that I knew from an online mom's group. And this was before that was commonplace to say that you have friends that you've never met Um, But she's a friend I'd never met. I reached out to her on the the phone and asked her if she wanted to start a podcast with me. And um, really, the rest is history. We met for pie and cheesecake and talked about Marie Antoinette, who ended up being our first subject. Susan, did you even have familiarity with podcasts at that point? No, actually, I did not. I was at one of those crossroads in my life where I, my kid was going, last kid was going to school and I needed to decide what I was going to do with this next stage. She called me up without ever even hearing my voice, which I thought was pretty brave of her. And I said, yes. And then I had to go figure out how podcasts sound. I didn't have an iPod. I had to listen to, I listened to the Bowery boys on my computer and I was like, oh yeah, that sounds like fun. So in that first meeting, what did you decide that your mission was going to be? We decided that we were, and still are, storytellers. So we would go learn about something, and then we figured what excited us or what we were excited to have learned, um, other people would also be excited to learn. And our mission has always been to tell the story of a woman from history and inspire you to go out on your own and learn more about them. The same way I learned about the ladies in the book and then went out to learn more. And I think that's really served us well. What mm-hmm. uh, what in your, and this is for both of you, but what in your background led you to believe that you could tackle this topic <laughs> successfully uh, on an ongoing basis? Had you had backgrounds in history or backgrounds in any kind of audiovisual work before? Well, it wasn't my D that I got in high school AP English. That, I mean, history, that's for sure. So uh, that w- I just, sound, it sounded like fun. I was a writer. Um, I was starting to build up my writing career, and so I can tell stories, I thought. And uh, so, yes. So, no, not history part, no. The speaking part, uh, I do have an associate's degree in broadcast communications, but that was like a million years ago. Becca Graham, what about you? 
So long ago, when I was a small child, I read one of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, um, the first one. And there toward the end, little tiny Laura looks around her house and, and Pa's playing the fiddle and the fire's crackling. And she's thinking, today is today. Surely it can never be a long time ago. <laughs> and and I, as a small child, had what might be a crisis <laughs> and thought, wait. <laughs> I'm looking around at the yellow shag carpet and and the burlap wallpaper and thinking, wait, today is today. It can never be a long time ago. And I realized that history is nothing more than just people who just happen to live in a different time frame and in different circumstances. And I think I have always thought of people in history as being real people handed a set of circumstances. And I really, really point to that um, as just the genesis of my love of history. Now, I was a theater major at KU. Um, I don't know how well stage plays prepare you for <laughs> this. I have to say the ignorance is bliss department is um, at play because I think if we had known what a vertical learning curve it was, we may not have started. And I am very glad that we just started. I mean, that's the hardest step is that first one. Listeners to your podcast often comment about the chemistry between the two of you, but the way you described it, you'd met online and really it was just one meeting. So was the chemistry instant when you sat in person or has it been developing over time? Oh, that's a really good question. (laughs) Um, I don't, I think because we had communicated a lot online in conversations, we kind of knew each other's personality. We both write kind of like we talk. Um, so that was already established. Um, but yeah, I think immediately we, we clicked. And then over time, you know, we learned more about each other. Obviously, you have to you work with someone for 10 years. Um, I think it's just deepened. And I'm still, I still marvel at how we are so very different people. But we can come together on just about, I can't think of one thing we haven't come to a consensus on except supper for dinner. <laughs> Regionalisms, yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts about the chemistry between the two of you, Becca Graham? I think it started um, very instantly, but just like any relationship, you get in-jokes and um, callbacks, and there's a shorthand that develops between us, um, just like in a long-term, you know, partner relationship, Um you just start to kind of understand how the other person might react to something. And um, Susan reaches in and pulls me up if I'm down and I do the same for her. And I just think it's been a very healthy um, relationship. And I'm glad that the listeners can, can sense what's going on behind the scenes, which is really just two friends enjoying what they do. But even pre-pandemic, you were not doing this in the same room. Is that right? You were each doing it from your own place? We started out sitting at my big dining room table at the House of Wood. (laughs) And um, it became so named because it's just full of echoes. I live at a very old house. Um, So over time, it was kind of easier to just take advantage of modern technology and work remotely. So we've actually been recording remotely for what would you say Susan seven eight years maybe um I I I I couldn't tell you maybe yeah 2015 20 ish Beatrix Potter I think was the first one we did remotely so whenever that was how how has the equipment changed that's made things easier for you over the (laughs) 10 years well the connectivity has really improved um just everywhere um we're, we're not dropping calls as much. We've got good microphones. Um, the technology that changed was really behind the scenes. Back when we started, we had to actually have someone help us write an RSS feed, which is basically how another computer reaches in and is able to subscribe to your show. There was a button now that just says, create my RSS feed and, <laughs> and hey, presto. But um, But literally we had to you know, get experts in code writing in to help us at the beginning, whereas nobody has to do that now. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. How do you divide the work for a particular podcast between the two of you? 
we we decide um, through various means on a subject, and then we literally just separate. Um, I know this is hard for people to comprehend, but Susan has a different library system than I do. She has different interests than I do. She has a different background. And so what we do is we go birth to death. Typically, that's our outline. So we needn't talk about the person anymore until we come back together. We have written our individual notes in that format. And then our goal is for it to surprise each other with yeah. things that we've learned. <laughs> and we're very careful not to speak about the subject um, in between when we choose her and when we meet to talk about her. Uh, that's true, because I can only remember, I think, twice that we even talked about it. We were covering a woman um, from Kansas City named Annie Chambers, and she was a madam during the Wild West era and the establishment of the city. And we both read that she was there for one of Lincoln's presidential parades or during his campaign, and we were both so excited about it. We did say that. that was, But that was a million years ago. Um, so, yeah. And the other time, it was just something that was, um, it was going to be a touchy subject. And we, I just wanted to know how she was looking at it. And that's about it. You've recorded more than 170 episodes so far. How do you select the individual people that you profile from a episode to episode basis? Well, we do have a list and it's a couple thousand people long, but honestly, we listen to our guts and I listen to Beckett's gut a lot because she's got this uncanny knack of like just saying, yes, we should cover her. And that's somebody that might come up in the news and we had no idea. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of research or, you know, planning ahead of time. Like, Oh, such and such is going to have a movie coming out. We should cover her. We don't really do that. Well, how, do, how do you do your research? Uh, and, and it goes to the question of authenticity. When people are listening to your podcast, uh, ha- you're not historians by training. So how can you uh, let them know that what you're com- communicating to them is, in fact, authentic? What we do at the end of every show, we have an extensive section called media. And in that section, we actually disclose all of our uh, sources that we used to come up with um with our show and that serves two purposes it speaks to the authenticity and also it allows people to then go to their library app and order those books from their library or go to audible and get the audiobook um not everyone can call a university in ghana perhaps to talk about (laughs) um assorted people um but you know sometimes um Research-wise, we depend on experts in their field, and then we give them credit for having spoken with us and disclosed and we do, the knowledge that they gave us. No, you're in. Oh. We do uh, fact-check each other as we're going, because if something the other person hadn't even read, we'll be like, are you sure about that? And we'll just stop recording and look it up or make a note to look it up later and say it a couple different ways so that we make sure that the you know, the fact gets into the show. So that we have our own personal fact checking and then we're fact checking each other when, during recording and during editing. How uh, long is each individual podcast? Our <laughs> shortest, I think, is Mrs. Santa Claus. And I think she's seven minutes long. And then our longest, I think our longest reaches almost four hours, but we broke it into two shows because that's really just it's too much to edit as one show (laughs) and it was too much for a a listener to, you know, commit to. Um, So we just say that we go until we're done and then we stop. But generally about an hour would be typical of most of the podcasts? An hour to an hour and a half. Yeah. And how much time goes into producing a typical hour and a half podcast? Including research time? Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we, we, logged it one time and we came up with like 120 hours each something something for each podcast 120 Mm -hmm. hours each each Mm -hmm. yeah yeah we start research months before you know we'll just casually read books like oh we we might want to cover her later so we just you know if we have some free time we'll just casually read a book about her so it's really hard to quantify it 
Yeah, I kind of liken it to summer stock. We're always researching one while finalizing the notes for another, while editing another. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, um, so it's hard to kind of have a linear, um, you know, we're, we're just constantly, I mean, we read at the ball fields, we read during <laughs> school pickup lines, we, you know, read by the side of a pool. It's gotten to the point where people are like, so, you know, who, <laughs> what book do you have in your handbag? Because we always do. Yeah. It's pretty constant. Is this a, a full-time job for both of you now? It is for me, but we we definitely split the work. Um, so I honestly don't know how Becca does it. <laughs> I consider it my full-time job. So during the week where she's doing her day job, I'm researching and um, doing the things that she has to slip in at other times. Yeah, I say in, jokingly that I didn't sleep in my 20s because I was out, didn't sleep in my 30s because I had a baby, and then didn't <laughs> sleep in my 40s because I have this podcast. So, um, no, I have uh, I have a full-time job, and I do this also and have done um, both of those things for the entirety of the 10 years. <laughs> when do, yeah. when uh, do you typically record? Um, wow. Usually... Um, like Sunday afternoon or Monday evening um, is usually our recording time. We're talking in March, which has been designated as Women's History Month. Uh, why do you both uh, think that it is important to study women's history as a, a singular field? Well, women and girls, for one thing, are just hungry, hungry for role models. Um, we keep hearing representation is important, and that really is so true. The amount of of emails and other messages that we get from very, very young girls and or their mothers saying how um, either the subject that we cover or just the very fact that they hear two women speaking in that format, um, how it has really affected them. I just really feel like anything we can do to inspire um, to just inspire people with like a can-do attitude or just that little bit of courage, that little bit of help to to kind of um, just rely on themselves. I don't know. I think that's why. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, all throughout history, women have typically been the woman behind the man. And what we get to do here is we get to talk about the men behind the woman, but focus on her life and tell the story from her point of view. So um, the fact that we get to do that, we, like Beckett said, hope it inspires people to do the same. And we know it does. You know, people listen as friends and then they come together and have conversations about the podcast. Whole families listen together on car rides or, um, classes listen together and then it's they have their own conversations just like we do so it's important that we get women onto the same level um, playing field as men as far as how history is told in the 10 years that you've both been doing the history chicks have you seen a change in the way that women's history is told or the amount of women's history that's being told oh and yeah both yeah, yeah. Um, oh definitely just from back in the the dark ages when we were kind of feeling our way around it, um, it was a lot more challenging to find biographies. Um, there was a lot more um, original source material we had to reference, a lot more digging. Um, I am so happy about how much easier it has become to obtain a library book, um, a biography on a woman. In history, I just, I mean, it really in the last maybe five years has become exponentially a different, um, just a different field out there. Yeah, when we started, as far as I know, there were no other women's history focused podcasts out there. Now there's many, which is great because people can find the show that resonates with them, you know, the host that they relate to. We uh, talked beforehand that we weren't just going to talk about how you do it, but also give people a little bit of history lessons along the way as we did this. And uh, what uh, we're going to start with are two women that you have profiled who were native to their lands, indigenous people. One is Pocahontas. What mm -hmm. can you tell our audience about what you learned about Pocahontas? Well, <laughs> what you learned about Pocahontas in the Disney movie is, you know, categorically um, 
wrong. Um, she was a small child when John Smith met her, um, and, and she was actually kidnapped by the English at one point and um, held captive for about a year um, in order to force her people to come to the table with a um, series of um, concessions to the English. Um, so <laughs> it's not happy. No. news and, and it and normally isn't um when we go to such a um, mythologized figure to hear the the real story behind it um john smith also sort of amplified her role in quote saving him from death and destruction as a way to kind of amplify his status back home with queen anne um yeah and he had a lifelong history of scheming you know just to get his way and um he was quite a salesman i guess is a good way to put it the other that uh chose from your list is uh the queen lilio kalani from hawaii uh, what did you learn about her in your research quite honestly before this show started i had never heard her name and a, a listener had written in early on asking us to cover her so i looked her up at that point so I learned everything. <laughs> uh, but I, she was um, she was native, obviously, Hawaiian. She was in the royal bloodline. She was educated by the uh, Christians who came to Hawaii to convert Hawaiians. And the Hawaiians welcomed them because they thought they were just, you know, it being part of a community of the world. And they sent their kids to their schools so they could become ambassadors around the world. Um, for their country. And so the fact that she could learn all that, she was bilingual, she was bicultural, uh, she did travel the world. She was at Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. And the treatment of her at the very end um, of her reign, which was not very long, was horrible. I mean, the um, we do a 30 second summary at the very beginning of every episode. I think you played one at the beginning of this one, but the 30 second summary for this one was the church guys wanted Hawaii and they took it. The rich guys wanted Hawaii and they took it. The military guys wanted Hawaii and they took it. And that's that's the story of Queen Lulu Kwani because she came in with the church guys. And what happened to her at, at the end of her life? She was imprisoned. She... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, when she was overthrown, she was imprisoned, and then she was retired once uh, America, you know, the United States annexed Hawaii, and she was she was a queen to the Hawaiian people. But at that point, the Hawaiian people, their population had been so decimated that there wasn't as many of them there as there were the white people who would come in. It sounded like, Becca Graham, you wanted to add a little more to that story. I, uh, we found ourselves in tears at the end, just after all the struggles with how hard she tried to, you know, save her country and her people. And to, um, she was really deposed right at the end for insisting upon voting rights for people of Asian descent and native hawaiians and that was the tipping point which kind of brought the kingdom of hawaii to a relatively uh firm end and she wrote that song um we're probably famous um we probably know the song aloha oi she actually wrote that and um as the flag of hawaii came down that song was played and everybody bowed their head um there's a lot of emotion that we sometimes bring into the show when we just like, we just feel for somebody, you know, that like after all the effort, it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, on a lighter note, <laughs> Queen Lilio Kalani is mentioned in Little Women. When Amy uh, is in England, she mentions that she saw the queen of the Sandwich Islands, and that was Queen Lilio Kalani. We uh, started with two uh, women of color, and I'm just wondering in general, especially now with the emphasis on diversity and learning the stories of diverse people, uh, how do you two ensure that you really are inclusive in the kinds of women that go onto your list? Um, I think at the beginning, it was, we had, we have to cover whoever, you know, this 
to represent. And now we just do it naturally. And now it's, you know, the, mm -hmm. our next subject is a woman of color, but um, we didn't look at her like that. We looked at her as someone whose life we really wanted to know. So quite honestly, this has, I don't I hate this word. This is the, just all the research and knowing these women and seeing the world from their eyes. Um, it's really made me more empathetic and understanding of our world, you know, and the diversity that's here in the United States and the problems that are here, the race relations. I, I don't think I would have um, been able to internalize them as much as I have been able to because of the show. One thing that I um, have learned from doing this show is that when you investigate one person, it will naturally lead to interest in other people. So when we covered Ida B. Wells, we naturally got interested in Mary Terrell, who perhaps doesn't have, you know, the name that Ida B. Wells does. Um, and that led us to Frederick Douglass. And we don't always talk about who we call the roosters on this show, but that knowledge lies there, it, you know, in the back of our head. And then Frederick Douglass leads us to Lydia Pinkham. Frederick Douglass leads us to Susan B. Anthony. So, you know, at as we go on, I, I always say history is an octopus, and it, and it sort of <laughs> is. It's more like a family tree. Um, you kind of naturally start covering um, a wider range of subjects than at the beginning when you just had to rely on kind of looking in the dark for who, who you might cover. But now I do think it is a very natural evolution. Was the term you used the roosters? Yes. yes we, <laughs> what, so, who are they? So our show... Um, the history chicks, uh, we constantly say, are we the chicks or are they the chicks? And, and, you know, we're old enough to say the word chicks to refer to ourselves. But so we jokingly say that they're the, the chicks and that anytime we mention a, a male character, we refer to him. It's a, another one of those in jokes that just developed over the years. <laughs> He's just the rooster. And we always threaten that we're going to have a rooster show. Um, we yeah. haven't done it yet, but we we haven't done it. But we've been able to tell the lives of some roosters by talking about other women, the Statue of Liberty, um, mm. the the women, Wizard of Oz. You know, we were able to talk about the men who created these, the men behind those women. So that was <laughs> good. That's how to, we get to a good time to in. ask. And I should have asked one at the Genesis question. How did you decide on the name, the History Chicks? That was Beckett. I think it's lost to history. I think I just, it just came to me and I liked it and I went and bought the domain name. I mean, there really wasn't more um, thought than that. And then our um, logo is based on, um, and it's gone through a little bit of a, a makeover, but our logo, logo is actually an antique um, pickle label. <laughs> um, and, and so that's kind of how our, um, our, intro song too has different layers it's um it's a classical song that has been reformatted by a computer and it actually also harkens back to the early days of like the commodore 64 commercials that used a version of that same song so i think that's how we are we're just like modern plus a layer of vintage in the background. You made reference to the fact that not all of your characters are real. Some of them are fictional. We've got an audio clip of a, a po podcast on Aunt Jemima from June 26, 2020. We're going to just listen to a little bit of it so people can hear what you sound like when you're doing the podcast, and then we'll come back and talk about Aunt Jemima. If you were an average attendee of the World's Fair, the Black experience you were most likely to encounter was Aunt Jemima. Nancy Green was worth her weight in gold for the Davis Company. She appeared in a giant flour barrel, tipped over on its side, cooking pancakes. She regaled the crowd with stories and songs of the Old South and dressed exactly like white America's glorious vision of a mammy and acting like one to boot. Mrs. Green's work gained the Davis Company over 50,000 orders from companies and individuals who wanted to buy Aunt Jemima pancake mix for themselves. The, <laughs> the fair organizers gave her a medal like, um, thanks for all the buzz. At one point, they had to... Hire and deploy special policemen to deal with the traffic, the eager, enthusiastic traffic around the Aunt Jemima exhibit. 
back to the history chicks after listening to you on your podcast. So uh, having worked on that podcast earlier this year, what was your reaction to the recent announcement that the Quaker Oats Company was retiring the image from their product? Um, I was not surprised. I thought it was... um it was about time. I had heard some buzz about that earlier in the year, and, and maybe that's what had lodged in my mind as to why we wanted to do Aunt Jemima. Long, long ago, we covered Betty Crocker, and we had wanted to do an Aunt Jemima show then, but really, I don't feel like we knew. I, I don't feel like we knew enough to be respectful and to understand the background, and and we finally felt like we were ready, and... The Aunt Jemima character actually comes straight off the minstrel stage. Um, she is a famous character, similar to Jim Crow. That name should sound familiar. Um, kind of a trope on the stage that was really stereotypical and, and not flattering at all. She and the, the whole Mammy figure as a whole sort of represent hearkening back to a South that honestly didn't exist. Um, so I, I'm, I am very gratified that they changed their logo. I think it's time. Susan, anything to add on that? Um, well, actually, that was one of the very few episodes uh, that we didn't do together. Beckett did it by herself. So I got to listen to it with everybody else. <laughs> but I think um, an episode like that is really good to look at because it gave... Back at an opportunity, not just to talk about pancake mix and the history and Nancy Green and the other 11 women or whatever that um, played the character of Aunt Jemima, but she was able to talk about minstrel shows and the history of the Mammy and what it represented in Southern society and how it made people, white people, feel better about um, what, you know, what they did in prison people. So I, I, I love that that was like the focus on that episode. Let's go back to historical characters. You referenced one of the ones on the list, and that's Ida B. Wells. What did you learn about Ms. Wells that you wanted to convey to your listeners? Well, Ida B. Wells was so brave. She was an investigative reporter, and she, in an era when this was not a safe thing to be doing at all, reported on the prevalence of lynching in the south um and she was a worker for civil rights she was a worker for women's suffrage she was actually threatened out of her office which was set on fire and um so that's how you know you're doing something right i think when you uh enrage people to the point i you know i i don't know what to say about how brave you have to be to come out against something that was almost seen as just, oh, well, that's just how it is around here. She moved up north and started writing for newspapers and made a name for herself. She was actually at the same World's Fair where Aunt Jemima was slinging pancakes over in the barrel. She and Frederick Douglass were over um, in a more serious venue trying to promote civil rights uh, and equal rights on the other side of the fair. Uh, Jane Adams is another of the social reformers that you have profiled in your podcast. Who was Jane Adams? She's considered the um, mother of social work. She established the first um, settlement house here in the United States. She had been to Europe and saw see, uh, she'd been to Europe and saw Toynbee Hall in England, which was a community of people helping the community. They lived in the community um, to create social change and social programs and help the people that were already established in the community. So she came to the United States, she's American, so she came back to the United States, established a community just like that in Chicago, except the difference between hers and the one in England is the women that she brought in to create these social programs um, and also to live there were women like her, you know, um, middle class, to upper middle class women, educated women, women that would not have been living in that neighborhood at all uh, were brought in and they were able to do things that society wouldn't have let them do anyway, you know, s- establish daycare centers and kindergartens and um, just di- a variety of welfare, um, not welfare, but like job placement programs and job training programs. 
So uh, she was pretty awesome in that regard. The um, thing that I love about Jane Addams is that was the era, the very first era when, when women were graduating from college in larger numbers than ever before. But then what does one do? You know, you've graduated from college and everyone claps and then society literally had no place for you for the most part after um, after all that education. And one thing that Jane Addams did, in addition to all her work with the poor communities that she served was provide a venue for those women to use their talents in a productive way for the common good. And, and um, I do believe that is why that movement caught on so heavily. All of this potential was just sitting there, coiled up like a spring, ready to explode. And then when given the chance and the opportunity, those settlement houses exploded all over the country. You described how uh, at the end of each podcast, you suggest uh, books and other resources that your listeners can follow up. Do you have any evidence that, in fact, History Chicks listeners are book buyers? Do you know that if you're moving books along, have you heard back from either publishers or from your listeners themselves? Yes. Well, yes, we we do help sell books. We all There's a um, History Chicks book club. We don't run it. Listeners run all of our programs. Um but they will pick a book that we've already used. So everybody in the book club will get that book. Um, Publishers contact us all the time with books and titles that are coming out. So that's the only evidence that I have (laughs) that it's being successful because we get inundated with, can you cover this book? Do you want to interview this author? And we don't even do interviews, which makes me laugh, but... Um, yeah, so that's the only evidence I have that we can sell books is that publishers are still contacting us to. Well, I will say that we books. actually get a lot of photos of that book to Mary and English Lord. Mm-hmm. When people <laughs> find them or order them, um, that is a common book that people will photograph and send to us. Like, look what I got. Yeah. Um, it's very exciting. So you not only record the weekly podcast, you write a blog about each subject. So if someone prefers reading, they can go that method. Um, They have photos and illustrations on the blog. You also post about your subjects on Twitter and Facebook. Across those various channels of media, which gets the most reaction, do you think? Well, Um, we have a Facebook group that is a community that basically runs itself. It's... uh, I mean, they do things in there like baking challenges inspired by episodes. They give each other advice. They recommend books. They recommend places to go stay. I would say the Facebook group is the hive of all the activity. And the great thing about that is it goes right into our philosophy that we we push the ball down the hill and then it goes. Like we don't really control what goes on in there. That's a that's a community focused environment. So I really do like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's been a couple things that have happened, that baking challenge that you talked about, as well as a weekly trivia game. There's a weekly trivia game every Saturday of people that are in that um, private Facebook group. It's called The Lounge. And again, it's listener started and listener run. And they meet every Saturday afternoon and play trivia. And they have been for a year now. So th- every Saturday. this all started from 10 years ago, an idea and a, a meeting over uh, coffee and some pastries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at what point did you say, this has clicked? This has really taken off in ways that we couldn't have imagined when we started it. Um, I think we were contacted by the Biography Channel to do some documentaries with them. And I think that was the moment for me when I was like, holy cow, you know, there's People, I knew people were listening. They didn't realize the span, like where they touched, and so that. But that was in what 2013 or something. So a couple, it was a couple years in. You know, we just keep getting hit with emails that, like, a listener sent in a note that said she had played a show of ours for the residents of her nursing home, which sparked a giant conversation about something. It, you know, in a room that hadn't been full of activity before, or small children take what they learned on our podcast and take it in with their little costume for History Day, or it's just like the rippling waves. We just don't know how far they've gone. Um, it, it is so gratifying 
at least to me, I, I assume it's the same for Susan to realize oh, yeah. that just like this little thing that we began is is really just leaving its mark as it goes. And and we don't even have to necessarily know the specifics of what have happened. Just I, I I'm just so thankful that we were able to make that kind of difference. And that's really what it's all about, I think. Susan, yeah. until uh, recently, you were a columnist for the Kansas City Star and like so many in the profession, laid off. I'm wondering about the medium of storytelling. You both described yourselves as storytellers. What's the difference between the kind of work you were able to do as a columnist and what you now can do as a podcaster? Uh, as a columnist, I wrote slice of life pieces. So they were all first person. I, I got sick of saying I and me but I did it for 10 years because I enjoy doing it. <laughs> but um, so I could look at my own life and see what was interesting, what people might relate to, what mistakes did I made and what did I learn, which is very similar to what we get to do on the show. You know, even uh, Ida B. Wells, we were just talking about, um, she at the beginning thought that people were being lynched because they deserved it. And once she realized that that wasn't the case at all, that she, she, that's when she turned around and started her anti-lynching campaign. So she had made a mistake and that's how she rebounded. So um, those are the two similarities. Now that you're working in a digital medium, uh, what are your thoughts more broadly as, as a uh, journalist about how local news, uh, especially through newspapers, survive when so many people are moving to platforms like the kind that you're now working in? Well, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> you know, my friends are being laid off. I was laid off. Um, they're not being able to find jobs as a journalist anymore, print journalist, because people are expected to get things for free. You know, if you can't access a newspaper, if there's a paywall, people get upset. And it's like, you know, these people are working. They've worked their entire careers to tell this story um, and report this news to you. And you don't want to compensate them for that. So I completely forgot your original question because I just kept thinking about everybody that got laid off. Uh, it's about the survival of local news. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't see it bringing up I think it'll probably change you know obviously print um, will not be around anymore in the volume it hasn't been in 10 years that we've been doing this you know the newspapers have declined so rapidly so I think it'll become more um, I think the pendulum is going to swing more towards independent journalists doing their own thing and then those independent journalists I if I was to guess would come together and the pendulum will swing back to a more, a larger group of people reporting the news. Um, we have about 20 minutes left in our hour with you. Let's go back to two of the women that you profiled in the History Chicks. Uh, this category I called successful businesswomen. Who is Lydia <laughs> Pinkham? Lydia Pinkham was a mom from Massachusetts who had learned growing up about herbal remedies. That's the things that worked for her mother and her mother's mother. And there was one particular concoction that she used as a midwife in her community um, for women's ailments. It was vegetables and uh, fruits and a lot of alcohol. And it helped women feel better in a time where you don't want the doctor to come to your house because you may be sicker after he leaves because of his treatments. So women like were wanting to get their hands on this product and she was in a financial strait and said, okay, well, let's bottle it and sell it. So she was an amazing marketer. She put herself on the cover. She made herself the face of the product. Women were from all over the country were writing into her, asking for advice on, you know, things in the, the women's sphere, you know, and she would write them back and then other people would write them back on her behalf later. But um, yeah, she just took off as far as, you know, brand marketing. And are her products still available in any form today? <laughs> yes, you can still get the vegetable compound. Uh, it does not contain the amount of alcohol that it used to. <laughs> I did order it. Actually, we both did, right? Yeah, we had a yeah. taste test on the show. We, yeah, and it tastes like dandelion juice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel any different afterwards. <laughs> But, well, um, Lydia Pinkham um, became a drinking song. 
I think largely because it was a 40 proof drink in an era of prohibition. Um, she became a drinking song. Um, like even um, she sprinkled throughout history. She was the remedy that one kept in the sink, even in the help. Um, I don't know about the movie, but in the book, the help, she said, there's some Lydia Pinkham under the sink. Why don't you get yourself a swig of that? You know, it was just something women turned to. Um, it was a household name like Hershey or, or craft or something and it was just something you had around the house and and lydia started that at her kitchen sink anything's possible one other yep. successful uh, it, it businesswoman that you've profiled is lillian gilbreth now you'll know lillian <laughs> gilbreth from her role as quote mom in cheaper by the dozen and she was given a little bit of short shrift in and that book to which her children apologized for that in the second book, actually. <laughs> um, she was a woman who had advanced degrees in an era when even a college education was pretty rare. Um, and the newspapers even said, despite her education, the new Mrs. Gilbreth is nevertheless an attractive woman. I mean, come on, law. <laughs> she uh, and her husband pioneered what's called motion study or um, how to make work in factories more efficient. She and her husband had many clients, and when he died, she assumed that the clients would stay with her, but it turns out that they had been regarding her as a helpmeet and not as 50% of the work on motion study and um, engineering. And so she turned, sort of out of self-defense, I think, to the home economics field, which was emerging as a scientific field of study. And she is responsible for the step trash can you have in your kitchen. She's responsible for the shelves that you see in your refrigerator door. She is responsible for the work triangle that every designer puts in the modern kitchen. Um, I, I am amazed uh, every time I read her story that she really took what she had learned and pivoted at a relatively advanced age and made a second name for herself. It, it's just she persevered. She persevered. I think she's such a great example for, you know, w working moms because mm -hmm. she's a great example and she's not so great in one aspect, but she's great because she did all this career things while she had uh, 11 living children um, raising. So she did the efficiency studies on their own family and they narrowed down how to function as a family into certain steps and how to do it most efficiently and the older children raise the younger children and all that so they all work together as a team in that regard so she could go out and um, do all the things that she did in society you know the bad part of course is that she was gone for a good chunk of the time Earlier in our conversation, you described uh, your reaction to the organic things that have happened as a result of the history chip, how people are learning and inspired to do their own things and how meaningful that is. Let me flip the question. How has the history chicks impacted both of you and perhaps changed your lives? Uh, Beckett? <laughs> well, well uh, you know, how emotional do, you know, should I get? I, I really yeah. feel... I really feel like this has been and continues to be, uh, you know, this is going to sound like goopy or whatever, but like my mission, like maybe this is the mark that I was meant to make on the world, um, it, which seems very grand, but I just mean it in a very small way. I really do. I just mean um, it means just as much to me when a little kid writes in to, you know, say thank you that it, you know, does to be, asked to be in a documentary. I mean, I'm just like amazed that this all came out of just a flash of inspiration. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the lesson, like listen to your flashes of inspiration because yeah. mine really has colored a decade of my life. Mm -hmm. And agreeing to do it has colored a decade of mine. Like I said earlier, I was really at a transitional stage in my life. So who I am as a woman now is I'm going to say 90% because of the work that we've been doing on the show. 
it's given um it's given my life a lot more energy than it had before. It's helped me, even though we don't travel very often. And I would love to go to all the places that we talk about. Um, I feel as though I've been all over the world and learned different things about different cultures all over the world, which is not something that would have happened in my, you know, I live in a very small town in my small town life, you know, PTO oppor opportunities don't let you, you know, travel like that. So. Don't you feel like that it's made a lot of connections in our brain? Oh. Like I, every time we get to a new subject, I'm able to just, I feel the connection snapping into place mm -hmm. and it faster. happens more. Yeah. More and more, the faster, the more we learn, the faster mm -hmm. they connect up. I really, um, I really think it's changed my brain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's totally changed my brain. And it's, um, I have so many friends that are near and dear to me that I've met because of the show and mm -hmm. they've just come forward and introduced themselves and you know they know us better than we know them but that narrows immediately and um so I'm grateful for that I'm grateful for every episode that we get out if it's the last episode that we do ever I'm grateful for the experience so I'd be sad if it ended but you know it's gonna at some point i guess when we hand it down to your son and our sons i don't know <laughs> the history dudes <laughs> not not outside the realm of possibility to have history dudes <laughs> uh you know to, to to give people a sense of the reaction uh, for your 10th anniversary show you you asked listeners to uh send you some thoughts on why they listen and and how it has impacted them we pulled about a minute and a half of that let's listen I have always loved history, and new women have been shortchanged, to say the least. But since listening to the History Chicks, I feel like I've had my perspective opened up. You guys have accompanied me on many a long drive from Florida to Chicago and back. Hi, my name's Sally, and I'm from Manchester in England, and I absolutely love the History Chicks podcast. Hi, my name is Lucy Real. I'm 10 years old, and I love to listen to History Chicks in the car with my mom. History Chicks is one of the reasons I decided to be homeschooled this year. You make learning about history so simple and interesting. It even inspired me to start my own podcast on global warming. I started listening to your podcast in the beginning of the COVID um, pandemic, and it's what got me through. I started with Marie Antoinette, and I haven't stopped. I love Audrey and... Coco's episodes because they brought me closer to my grandmother. I really like all the nit bits you get and the, all the tidbits of history. I think it's great. Hello, I'm Anne from Finland and I like listening to your show when I'm cleaning my apartment or walking in the forest as we do here in Finland. If I hadn't listened to History Chicks, I probably would never have found my extended essay topic and I might not even be in the IB program right now. Thanks to Becca and Susan for being the best history teachers I've ever had. Well, I get to watch your faces as that. As that, that clearly, I reach for the tissue, Becca. Becca yeah. It's clearly an emotional yeah. experience for you listening to yeah. your your listeners. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, obviously, digital technology is global, but were you surprised that you had listeners in places as far away as Finland, Finland and England? Um, you mean not, su not surprised? We. No. We we do speak to them a lot. They're they're in the lounge. They they send us messages. Um so we're not surprised. We're gratified. We're we're so happy. Um but no, not not surprised by yeah. now. No. And like I, I hate to keep talking about trivia, but I just think it's so wonderful. But when the trivia group meets, the woman who organized it lives in Northern Ireland. And there's people from Sweden. There's like two people from Sweden. There's a mother and a daughter from England that list that play together. And we've had people from Australia. So if we're playing it at three o'clock Central Standard Time, it's like <laughs> what the middle of the night in Australia. Um, so it's just so um, it just really warms my heart to be able to see these faces. Like when you were playing those, I know some of those people. And uh, you know, I've met them through the show. So um, yeah, it's it means a lot to me that that we are so, you know, that we're global. It's amazing. You know, one aspect of the work that we haven't talked about is its impact on your families. 
<laughs> talk about the amount of time that it takes you to do all this. How have your families reacted to this uh, second career that you both took on? Well, now, uh, my only and Susan's youngest were actually only five years old when we started. And I think they're used to um, the routine by now. They'll, uh, they're old enough now to read the same books that we're reading or ask pertinent questions. Um, I, I think that my son is very proud. I think he's very proud of the work that, that Susan and I do. I, I, I agree. I mean, obviously my, you know, they're my family. They're going to be inconvenienced and they're going to grumble <laughs> about that. It's like, you're recording today. Are you sure you don't eat? You know, it's like, no, I have to, it's what I have to do today. So um, I, that way they don't love it. But I think the overriding um, pride that they have in what Becca and I have accomplished um, gets them through it. <laughs> Both of our kids are on that 10th anniversary episode. Well, our youngest, I have two others that were older, um, but our younger, my youngest and her only were in that episode and my oldest. And my husband comes in when we need a deep voiced <laughs> quote or voice or uh, he did the Annie Oakley 30 second summary that I still love so much. Oh. I have it on my phone and I play it sometimes. I wish I could make it my ringtone, but <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Yeah, that was pretty cool. In the couple of minutes that we have left, the hour always goes by so quickly. But <laughs> uh, So if people are listening to this and say, gosh, I, I could do a podcast, what, what would your advice be to them? Do I would it. say start. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and don't let the technology bug you down. It is so much easier. Just um, Helen Zaltzman from The Illusionist has a really good, um, maybe we could send you um, the link. I wish I had it. At the top of my mind but she has there are out there just very simple here's what you need checklists it, it, it's just technology is one thing what you need is a topic which you've been inspired to do a podcast there's your topic and you need perseverance that's like the main thing you need it is just start and stick to it that's really the advice i have i would say do it if you're inspired to do it nothing's stopping you I know. Uh, um, so we do hear from. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, we, we do hear from a lot of people that start, they say, "Well, you guys can do it." I read them as, "You guys can do it, so I can do it." Um, but who they contacted us on how to start a show, and my first advice is, "Don't let your head get involved. Just do it. You know, mm -hmm. jump right in, make mistakes, learn from them, keep going." We have about a minute left, and I, I wanted to ask the, the sort of the seminal question, since you're two people who spend your time thinking about history. For people who have just discarded history from their classes in high school and say, why bother? My life is too busy. What's the value uh, in, in one's life of studying history? I think it's the seeing, you can see the patterns. Um, you, you can relate an episode in your life to something that happened in history and see how it played out. I, I just think it's um, perhaps not a blueprint, but maybe a map that you can choose to follow or, or not follow. Um, being familiar with something makes it easier to deal with, I think, later. Yeah, I would add that um, people need to realize that people in history have the same problems that we have now. You know, we read any of our subjects. They've had relationship problems. They've had their hearts broken. They've had job losses. You know, they've had hurdles very similar to our own. And they can, you know, they persevered and overcame them. So, and so yeah, you. if you regard people in history as being butterflies pinned to a board, then you're going to see them differently. And, it, and it's boring and it's, and it's nothing. But if you realize that they are just people just like you that were handed a set of circumstances that they dealt with, I think it's a lot more easy to apply uh, the lessons that you learn from history to your own life when you see the perspective of a person instead of someone trapped in the pages of a book. Well, if you have intrigued the C-SPAN audience, they can find you easily in places where they get podcasts, the History Chicks, more than 170 episodes and more to come. Thanks to both of you from your homes in the Kansas City metropolitan area for joining C-SPAN for the past hour. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. 
You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 